been involved in a lot of big WrestleMania moments. Um, we, over, over there, somebody had a WrestleMania 11 chair, and in that year, in the, you're in the main event with Shawn Michaels, there's Pam Landison, Jen McCarthy, and all that kind of stuff. You were going into that as the champ. Um, what are your memories of that WrestleMania and getting to be in the world title match? I remember vividly Pam. <laughs> I personally, I personally thought Jenny McCarthy was hot. Are we talking Pam, Bob Wire Pam? <laughs> no, I... Baywatch Pam. Uh, Baywatch Pam was a little young, but... So I like him. <laughs> no, I just... We, we ran so hard back then, like... You, you wrestled the night before WrestleMania. So, I mean, half the time, it was just, it was just another match. You know, it was, as bad as that sounds. I remember Scott and I worked SummerSlam together, and we both had personal appearances that day. We got to the arena, and I looked at Scott, he looked at me, and he goes, let's just do our C match. I went, perfect. <laughs> like, we didn't even, like, we were so beat, we couldn't even... I mean, you know, once we got out there, the people, you know, they were just, they would, they would run you to the ground. Where now, you know, it's, it's still yeah, that's it's funny. funny. After a couple guys left, everybody gets guaranteed money now. Hmm. And everybody works a reduced schedule now. Hmm. Wonder, wonder who those young cats can thank for that, Kev. Pam Anderson. <laughs> Well, I remember, the, I remember uh, Honky Tonk Man had said one time in an interview that about WrestleMania 3, someone asked him about it, he said, I don't remember, because I was wrestling 25 days that month. So do you think, like, because when you guys went to WCW, the schedule was much better. Do you think that for a wrestler to have longevity, you need to have a sort of easier schedule than four or five nights a week? Well, you take any sport. I mean, you know, people say that, you know, pro wrestling is fake, but it's, it's predetermined. I mean, there's a lot of guys in our era and the, the new era, especially now. Uh, I'd like to see somebody sit in this ring and let Brock Lesnar suplex him 12 times and then roll out and say, you know, that, I didn't feel that. That's just fake. I mean, it's we're the only guys that don't have an off season. You know, the only, only time a pro wrestler has an off season is when he's got his, leg in a, you know, his legs in a cast, his arms in a sling, his neck's being fused. We're, our, our, our off time is when we're hurt. And it always has been like that. And it's just until they rotate talent, and, and because that's, there is no off season, there's not going to be an off season, but they need to rotate talent on at least nine months and give the guys three months off. It's, it's tough on your family. You work every Monday. You have a raw every Monday. So what kind of vacation do you have with your family for the 20 years that you're there? You got a six-day vacation, tops, and that's you leaving your family and flying to the city to go make Raw. I, th I think the best thing that the WWE has done over the last few years is start incorporating the women and pushing the women because they go out there and tear it down every night, you know, and that makes it... Now, when you go to signings, little girls come up to you. When I first broke in, it was totally a dude audience. It was all dudes. Now, there's little girls coming around because they watch women on TV, and they want to grow up to be wrestlers. And they got Bailey T-shirts on or Sasha Banks T-shirts on. And I think it's great. I think it's great. You know, there's plenty of money for everybody. And when you, when you guys were wrestling, obviously it was more like the Nitro Girls and Sunny and all that kind of stuff. Were there women at that point who really did want to wrestle? Or was it just that the women who were there were quite content to be a manager? Or, or... I mean, we had, like, Medusa was, you know, was a, was a, was a wrestler, you know, like a, 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 a good quality. It's always hard to find an opponent for her. Well, there was Bull Nakano. Bull Nakano was but, good. I mean, they were the only two women in the whole territory for years. Luna. Luna. You yeah, know, well, that was a different era, you know. I, th I think, like, uh, like Trish, Amy, that group of girls, like, were the first ones that, that kind of got, you know, 
made it like they were attractive, but they could also go like the guys and give you know. And now, now we I remember the, the the first main event, a female main event was the NXT in Brooklyn before SummerSlam a couple of years ago, and it was Sasha versus Bailey, and we were at we Scott and I were both at that event, and. I didn't see it. I didn't see a, a, another match the entire weekend come close to that, you know. And that's saying a lot. And those two girls just they went, they went out there and rocked it. So, and you know, for, for WrestleMania to end with 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 the three girls, you know, and, and nobody bat an eye. I mean, it was a great match, you know. And so, you know, when 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 the females are are, are now being paid equal what their male counterparts are. You know, that's, it says a lot for just, I mean, society as a whole, but finally wrestling's finally kind of caught up. And then just to kind of move subjects, I was watching some old WCW the other week, and it was the angle where Dusty Rhodes... So you're the one. I know, it's me all the time. Thunder, Nitro. Um, but it was when Dusty Rhodes joined the NWO, and he came out and he had the cool jacket on and all that kind of stuff. And when he joined, it just felt like this could be great because he was really into it, but it didn't really seem to go anywhere. Did you guys have a hand in kind of pushing for that to happen, and why did it not go any further? Um, I remember that being my idea. I think I was working, um, and I, I was working against Larry Zbysko, who had left the broadcast booth and you know got involved with a match with me against Lex Luger or something, and so now it's going to be me versus Larry. And I had this kid, Larry, Louis Piccoli, out there with me, and it was me and him versus Larry. And we started double teaming Larry. And I pitched this to Dusty before I ever mentioned it to the office. And uh, Dusty left the broadcast position, came to the ring, and everybody, you know, I was backing up, and then he dropped that big elbow on Sabisco and peeled the flannel shirt off, and he was NWO. And I felt really happy to do something cool for Dusty. Because at that time, they were looking at him like he's a relic. Like, yeah, he was really good, but, you know, he got too old. And I remember thinking, no, man, being cool doesn't expire. There's no expiration date on being smart. But the very next night on Nitro, and when you give the American Dream a live mic, he does not disappoint. And the first thing he said was, ain't going to be no comeback. Ain't going to be no comeback. You know, he was just making a one-time statement. Occasionally, he would accompany to the, me to the ring, like manage me, but only if I'm winning. If I'm doing a job, he says, "Young, young kid, I'll be back here, you know. Uh. And um, Kevin, the, one of the things that gets brought up a lot by fans, and it's probably going to make you shake your head when I bring it up, is the finger poke of doom. Um, and I know Goldberg was pretty annoyed that it, coming out of it he didn't get to get the big win over the NWO when you look back on the finger poke of doom do you think people m make too much of a big deal out of it or what is your kind of memory of it now 20 years later well just the fact that we're still talking about it tells me that it was effective to some degree <laughs> <laughs> nobody's talking about the drop toed the drop the drop toed death move I mean it's just the thing is, it got everybody. Do you think, because that was the night where... They said it killed the big... They said it killed the business. They said it killed WCW. And I've said this a million times. So many people that watch wrestling live in a wrestling bubble. And what killed WCW was the fact that Turner sold to Time Warner... Time Warner sold to AOL. AOL was a dot-com. There was this thing in 2003 called the dot-com crash. AOL stock was worth nothing. Not only did they sell WCW, they sold the Atlanta Braves, the Atlanta Hawks. They sold everything that wasn't bolted down. It had nothing to do with the finger poke of doom. Everybody switched when they said ahead of time that Mick Foley was going over, like a million viewers switched that didn't even see the finger poke of doom. So it's all those people that just absolutely love me and want to put some blame on me, and I got big wide shoulders, and I can take it, because you know what? That finger poke of doom looks real sweet when I'm drinking coffee and looking out at the beach every morning.
Are you and I mean, you were also at one point on the WCW booking committee, and that's kind of like a thankless job, I guess. That no matter what you do, you're going to get blamed for the bad stuff and never uh, credited for the good stuff. But from your time in doing that, was there an angle or a storyline that you remember pitching or being quite heavily involved with that you're proud of? At that point, the Titanic had already hit the, the iceberg. I was just trying to get the guy with the cello to keep playing. That's a shoot. I did try to get Pam Anderson to come in and hit me with a Frankensteiner. <laughs> she didn't go for it? Nah, so it's good comedy. I keep going back to her. Um... So also, you guys both obviously at various points went to TNA, and they had a lot of money behind them, and it kind of feels like almost a wasted opportunity in a lot of ways, because they had, they had a lot of the talent, they had a lot of the opportunities, they had the TV. Um, is it as simple as having Dixie Carter in, you know, in, as the head of it who didn't know what she was doing, or what was the reason you think that TNA never got uh, off what, the ground? I mean, one of the biggest things that I used to remember, that I used to would be dumbfounded, was... During TNA programming, they would talk about the UFC nonstop. All the ads were for UFC, but during the UFC, they never talked about TNA. Spike TV never talked about TNA. Like they, they never, they never put. And we at once with the main event mafia, we were doing like two five two sevens, which is probably what Raw does now. So it's like we did numbers. It's just that they didn't. I mean, it's 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 very difficult because from a from a standpoint of commercials, a wrestling a, a wrestling show that does a three will not get the same commercial uh, rate of, of a show that does a two because the demographics usually more male, more younger, you know, male. It's a 17 to 35 white male demographic, which when you're selling a product doesn't cover as, as much as it used to. That's one of the things now with the, with the WWE is they have the female uh, audiences, the demographics a lot higher. That re raises their uh, ad rate. That's why the Fox deal is so huge. And Scott, I want to ask you about when you were in WCW, Nitro was three hours at one point, Raw's three hours right now. There's rumors that SmackDown might go three hours. Do you think a three-hour wrestling show is effective? Or is there anything that they can do to make that more enticing for people? I remember being on the very first Raw, and it was one hour. And when you subtract the commercial times, it's about 42 minutes or something. So it was really exciting. It was must-see. And then uh, when... I just think it, I think it's way too long. I've heard Triple H go on record saying the hardest thing in the world to do is write that third hour because basically it's a free pay-per-view every week. And then Smack, SmackDown to me is more exciting because at least it's only two hours. I'm a fan of the one-hour wrestling show, you know, and then you can rotate the talent. You don't have to beat the same people to death every week. You can rotate your talent, give new people opportunities, bring up the young guys. I mean, anybody watch NXT? It's a one-hour show, and it's exciting because it's not so drawn out. There's not guys doing 20-minute interviews in the ring basically just to kill time. You know, I, but, I mean, more wrestling is more wrestling. More guys are getting opportunities. But I, me as a fan, I think it's boring. I won't go to. I won't, I won't go see a motion picture that's three hours long. I'll wait till it's, it comes to some kind of streaming thing in my home, because at 60 years old, there's no way I'm going to be able to sit for three hours and not go to the bathroom. Unless it's Pam Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I can do three hours of Pam. S see, I'm, no, but it, I'm like the Jerry Lewis to the Dean Martin. You know, I throw in the little sidekick thing. But I mean, like, like I remember the first time I watched Avatar, and um, it's three hours long. To this day, I don't think I want. I mean, I've, I've watched bits and pieces of it, like flipping through. Titanic's the same thing. I don't want to watch Titanic every Monday. I don't want to watch Avatar. I don't want to do anything for three hours. About a 15-minute break. <laughs>